Hi there. I recently watched a documentary about Second Chance Body Armour and its founder, uh, Rick Davis. And I thought I'd uh, review the documentary, but also talk a little bit about um, Second Chance and also my experience with it. So uh, it all really started with uh, Rich Davis was, uh, he owned a pizza parlor in Detroit and um, he was doing a takeaway delivery when he was ambushed by uh, a gang of three guys. And he got into a gunfight with them, put rounds into two of them, but the third one uh, shot him in two places. Uh, while recuperating from this, he had the idea that um, there's got to be a better way uh, to uh, prevail in a gunfight uh, against uh, numerous opponents uh, besides getting shot. And the idea of body armour uh, came to mind. Now, it's, it's not a new idea, obviously, but he thought he could um, come up with some uh, new wrinkles to it. And uh, the first vests he made were hand-sewn um, using uh, various materials but uh, he hit upon Kevlar which was made by the DuPont company and it was designed to replace steel in radial tires and it was uh, very very high tensile strength while being very light and also being um, a fibre which was uh, very very pliable. When um, uh, sewn together and woven, uh, tightly woven uh, into a fabric, um, it would resist penetration by missiles, uh, bullets and blades, uh, but it was also um, very um, able to, um, to be moved in any direction. Uh, it allowed movement, it was uh, rather like cloth. In contrast to um, hard armour, like steel or the leather and bamboo armour that had been developed um, by the samurai or by the medieval knights. So uh, he started uh, marketing it in the local area and um, Evan Marshall was a detective in the Detroit police at the time and he saw the potential, um, having seen a lot, lots of people shot, he, um, with a young family, he thought that he wanted to survive every night to go home. And the idea of um, body armour that would stop the bullets uh, was a good idea. And he was convinced that it would work uh, because Rich Davis, um, in order to promote the vest, um, made a film of himself uh, shooting himself um, and then going on to uh, shoot some targets. So uh, Evan was probably the first uh, police officer to buy a vest um, and one of his colleagues, Ron Jagielski, was um, uh, similarly convinced by Evan's vest and bought one himself and became the first save save number one and from then on uh, hundreds were saved by second chance vests and Richard Davis made um, a couple of uh, movies to promote the vest by getting guys mainly well almost all police officers who had been shot on the vest unable to return fire um, brought them down to Central Lake Michigan and made a uh, reconstruction of the saves and uh, put a bit of entertaining stuff in between some sketches and uh, weapons and ammunition demonstrations and so on. They, they were highly entertaining and I've still got a copy on VHS tape but at the core was demonstrating the value of um, the vests and the second uh, tape he made was to demonstrate that the vest would stop magnum rounds 357s and so on 44s um, 
and the officers could still return fire. So this was um, what made the guys believe in the value of the vests and go out and spend their money because at that time the vests weren't issued and officers had to pay hard-earned money to, to get hold of them. Uh, one, of, one of the misconceptions at the time uh, was that, yeah, um, Kevlar would stop a bullet, but the blunt force trauma would be um, directed at, uh, at the torso and the internal organs, and that would incapacitate. You'd end up on your back and you'd be out of the fight for a period of time. And this was actually the view within um, British Special Forces. And uh, I remember having a conversation with um, a very senior um, expert and uh, tried to persuade him that um, there was no need for the what they call trauma attenuation packs, which are usually filled with K-pop, that they suggested wearing under the armour to stop this blunt force trauma. And I, I pointed in the direction of all these saves uh, that were being racked up in America, where the guys were... were able to continue fighting so that that was one non-issue and um i remember masa you talking about um a demonstration he attended where a government expert um was showing the the problem and he put a vest over um a torso made out of um clay um uh, which would show the the impact fired a round which the Kevlar vest actually stopped but when you took the vest panels off the clay torso there's modeling clay quite dense there was quite a big impression in it and the expert pointed out that it was so deep that it would uh, rupture internal organs and so on and, and it would be um, almost as lethal as being shot um, Masa Ayub ambled over to this and um, kicked the clay torso with his boot and left an even bigger dent and said, well, my kicks must be more deadly than bullets, if that's the case. And um, the fact of the matter is that the uh, rib cage is elastic and um, will absorb the, the trauma. And um, theory aside, I, on either side of the argument that the actual saves really demonstrated uh, another problem and um, the, the second chance had competitors who were basically copying the idea um, and, and, and telling lies um, in, in um, the commercial world you know this seems to be a good practice um, the American government in, in the form of the National Institute of Justice also came out with some rather bizarre requirements. Now, Kevlar as a material will degrade under a couple of conditions. One is direct UV sunlight, and the other is if it's um, waterlogged. The, the weave can, can open up. Now, <clears throat> the UV problem is largely um, irrelevant because the, the vest is not exposed the, the kevlar itself is within a cover covering which in itself is within a, a carrier which is under a, a, a garment so uh, it's not actually directly ex exposed to, to sunlight that, that seems to be a non-issue um but the water logging uh, problem uh, seemed to overly concern the american government and uh, if you fell into uh, a ditch or a lake or a river or a swimming pool and were in there for some time, no doubt the vest would lose a certain amount of its ability to uh, stop penetration. Um, so getting into a gunfight while you were submerged or immersed uh, or shortly afterwards wouldn't have been a good idea. A couple of points. Firstly, the vests tended to actually work better than they were rated for. Uh, no vest 
has ever been defeated by a bullet it's been rated to stop and in fact it has stopped bullets in excess of the rating i won't go into the best rating levels because they're bizarre in itself and another product of government bureaucracy but um there have been cases of best rated to stop pistols having stopped rifle bullets so there is a built-in um, leeway there even if the the vest is waterlogged which in itself is a rather far-fetched and, and um, probably uh, well I, I'm not aware of any cases where it actually happened but what the NIJ uh, insisted was that the vests be sealed in plastic to stop water getting into them. Now, what this means is that they were highly uncomfortable to wear. You can imagine wearing something encased in plastic um, quite close to your skin in hot weather. Uh, it, you're going to sweat profusely and you're not going to wear it and comfort's a big thing uh, the, the first vest i ever bought um before second chance was available over here uh, a firearms dealer had a sample of a vest from uh, one of the other manufacturers what, it, i don't think it was kevlar but if it was it was put together in a, a terrible way i because there was nothing else on the market i did buy it and I, I, I didn't actually use it that much um, it was very rigid and very uncomfortable and um, shortly afterwards um, Holsters Unlimited in Liverpool were actually importing second chance I went down had a look at Avesta and ended up buying one of Paul and uh, I wore that for quite a while and then um, Marcus um, suggested that he could um, get me a vest through the well he was um, with the air marshals at the time to the uh, u.s government purchasing system from second chance and it would be made to measure be very very comfortable and uh, you know sort of um, uh, a bespoke uh, vest i had to send my measurements and uh, after a short period of time the vest came through and it had the normal six points uh, carrier but it also had uh, this system the uh, t-shirt carrier and uh, it's very very interesting that the the panels fit into the, this um, this ordinary t-shirt and uh, it, it's very very comfortable and very easy to wear and I, I wore that on, on protection jobs uh, for many years um, I had sold my first second chance vest um, at, a, at a profit and then um, over the years they suggest that you upgrade your vest or, or replace it and after several years I, I, I sold the vest that Marcus had, had um, procured for me and um, I upgraded it to my current vest. Um, still nice flexible vest and in its six point carrier and it is a another second chance one of the other things that richard davis did was he started a bowling pin match at his facility uh, at central lake and uh, this was a an annual event uh, and it gathered um, police officers and shooters from uh, all over the place and it went on for about five days and the idea was um, you shot um, five bowling pins off a table and it was only when the last pin had hit the floor that the time stopped and uh, bowling pins which are very readily available in America uh, they, they get dinged up in use and they become just waste so um, the the bowling alley uh, owners were only too glad for someone to take them off their hands and a bowling pin is actually almost identical to the inner kill zone and FBI uh, Q target so it's a fairly realistic 
plus you had to hit it center because if you hit it slightly off center the pin will just spin and fall over and you had to shoot it right off the table three foot table so that tested stopping power or it tested power of the cartridge as well so you had speed you had accuracy and power which is good um his prize um table was an interesting idea as well because he had sponsorship from many of the firearms companies and other people and he would put a table out with all these um, marvelous pistols and knives and belt buckles and uh, gold coins on and the winner got first pick and so on so it was a really interesting way uh, of, of distributing prizes uh, I've shot bowling pins, not in uh, official competitions, but one of the ranges we used to use uh, had some bowling pins and I've shot them and they really are uh, an interesting and um, quite practical um, shoot, shooting method. And, uh, you know, I think they, they are, do still have pin matches in various places. Okay, so to get back to the... Oh, but, and by the way, um, pin shooting became so um, popular that uh, Masai Yub actually wrote a book about it. So to get back to the documentary, um, the documentary maker raised quite a lot of uh, issues and concerns. Um, there were queries as to whether the famous pizza robbery actually took place now there is a certain amount of documentary evidence that it did um, but whether that is uh, fake uh, is a matter of opinion uh, there was a stray round from one of the pin matches and uh, it went through uh, a woman's window and there was a lawsuit as a result of that and it suggested that uh, Richard Davis used underhand methods to try to uh, to avoid uh, the lawsuit but the biggest problem was um, they were having massive success and selling uh, the vests which were made of Kevlar but a new material came I believe from um, the Netherlands called Xylon and um, it was even lighter than the Kevlar and they started making vests out of that and um, promoting them and selling them and they sold on quite a lot by this time they had large contracts with police departments who were now issuing vests and also with the military the problem was it became known that Xylon started to degrade very very quickly and turn into powder and lose its ballistic um, uh, uh, resistance now in the documentary um, it is clear that Richard Davis actually wanted to uh, go public with this and recall the vests uh, and, and make amends but by this time it was a public company and the board overruled him and they covered it up eventually as these things do um, the facts were made known and there was massive lawsuits and fines and um, second chance actually went under later on it was um, another armor company was started by Richard's son but uh, to my mind it could have all been uh, avoided had they just gone back to the, to Kevlar because Kevlar did the job and um, the later um, versions of the vests were getting much thinner and much more flexible than even the originals which were decent enough and uh, they, they they really the Kevlar vest did the job and uh, why they had to go to Xylon uh, it, it was a bad step the 
documentary maker does seem to be a little bit anti-gun uh, he doesn't know anything about firearms uh, he, he shows a guy um, uh, with a reloading machine making cartridges and he said the guy's making bullets also some of the stuff in Richard Davis's uh, movies um, which were sketches there was some where he lampooned the press uh, uh, they they're shown to uh, be doing a, a press con or press conference and quizzing a police officer about a shooting but that was what was happening at the time the press were um seriously anti-police and anti-gun and um were, were asking stupid questions about why didn't you shoot the gun out of the guy's hand and things like this and uh, the new york times for example had this campaign for many many years against hollow point ammunition calling it dum dum and and the press in general um had this campaign about cop killer bullets the ktw and all this kind of thing which no one had heard of until the press um, brought it to public attention so uh, you know there was really two views of that a, a, a lot of us thought the um, films that richard made were pretty much on the on the money however um to sum up richard davis shot himself dozens of times with numerous different calibers including the magnums um, to convince people of the uh, necessity to wear uh, concealable body on uh, and he subsequently saved hundreds of police officers lives directly through his company and indirectly through the people who copied him however the documentary does show that his legacy has been severely tarnished by commercial considerations and um, it, it's very unfortunate and um, it's really the whole thing leaves a very very nasty taste in the mouth because uh, Richard Davis did have lots of support within the firearms and police community and um, unfortunately it turned out that that was misplaced uh, it's an interesting documentary uh, it doesn't pull any punches uh, and I'll put a link to the um, trailer for it and um, hope you enjoy watching it